Yeah, exactly. I, I moved to the next slide here um, about the different schools or, or tendencies or whatever you would call it of, of socialist thought. Because uh, there is kind of a progression here that's that's interesting that it goes from those early philosophers inspired uh, who became known as the um, the early utopian socialists. Um, oh, I was just thinking of their names and <laughs> it'll come to me in a moment. But, um, you know, the, the very early ideas uh, at the very beginning of kind of the industrial era, uh, you had some early. Um, oh, Fourier and Owen. <laughs> and um, yeah. Those, those folks, they, um, at the very beginning of the industrial revolution, you already had some folks thinking, you know, the, the way that this is oppressing workers and treating workers doesn't seem right. You know, how can, how can we, uh, do better? How can, how can we create a better society? And, um, Owen, for example, I think, um, was a factory owner, but recognized this. And so tried to set up his factory in a way that the workers actually, um, you know, democratically made decisions in the factory and things like that. So you kind of had these early experiments where, where folks were trying to get workers to have more um, say in things and just kind of plan out better socialist societies. Um, and so that, that's where the word utopian comes from. And in today's language, I think folks would use it as a negative. It wasn't really meant negative back in the day. Um, <laughs> Um, it, it was just meant more for, um, you know, how do we create um, a better society? Um, how do we create a, a good society? It's, it's, I think it's Greek, Greek roots, right? Utopia. It's literally good, good city or good society or something like that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, I mean, Engels came from a factory owning family. Yeah, right. So those were your early socialists. And, and um, you know, Marxism, I, uh, Karl Marx, I think, did, did a really... Uh, was kind of a big turning point of taking um, the philosophical aspects and, and really making the solid analysis um, that folks could um, could study and then um, grow, right, based on new information and stuff that uh, Chris was talking about as uh, time went on, because capitalism itself has been evolving during this whole time period. Um, it's It's absolutely true that the the form of capitalism that existed in the 1700s, 1800s, it's very different from what we have today. Today, you could call neoliberalism because in the 1700s and 1800s, they called that liberalism. <laughs> you were a liberal if you supported markets and things in the 1700s. Um, and we have like this new global form of uh, markets control of the global economy. And so that's why it has a new name, right? Neoliberalism. If you want to piss off a Republican, <laughs> Tell them they're a member of a liberal party. <laughs> right, right. Because they Congress are. were liberals, yeah. <laughs> the, the, uh, the United States was founded as a classically liberal democracy. Yep. Uh, basically meaning capitalism, but with some, uh, you know, regulations and some reins. Right. Um, right. And the, the, the variation of those, what the reins are, you know, is there, but... Uh, both the Republican and Democratic parties were, you know, founded as classically liberal parties, um, and it really makes uh, it, it's a whole problem we have in the United States with people not knowing what words the words they use, you know, mean um, <laughs> in the theory and traditional sense. You know, it's like libertarians um, in the United States are a far right wing, you know, ideology. Um, but the, the coiner of the term libertarian was someone mentioned here in a contemporary of Marx, Proudhon. Right. Right. He was one of the first people to use the word libertarian. He identified himself as libertarian. He was a contemporary of Marx, the communist, and Bakunin, the anarchist. And he wrote a uh, he wrote an essay called "What Is Property?" And his answer was theft. Yes. Right. <laughs> but so traditionally, libertarianism is a bottom left. Um, ideology kind of analogous to to, uh, to anarchism, right? Um, and I'm sure Bakunin and, and Proudhon could spend hours arguing why, they're, why, why I'm wrong and they're not actually similar. Um, but, you know, <laughs> looking at it from our, from our perspective today, they're both bottom left ideologies, very similar. Um, and what happened in America was they took the anti-state portion yeah. of libertarianism and they left out the anti-capitalist uh, portion of uh, libertarianism so if you go to the rest of the world if you go to live if you go to europe uh libertarians aren't right wingers uh they're, they're bottom lefters yep yeah exactly so you know we've had this interesting progression here we, we went from the early utopian socialists 
to uh, Marxists that um, yeah, tried to put it on a much more, um, you know, scientific philosophical basis, their analysis of capitalism. And broad, um, and, in, a broad base, in a broad basis. Yeah, broad basis. Right, right. The utopian socialist is, you know, Owen's trying to restructure his factory. And there, yes, might, right. there, was, there was a goal of that creates a model that then can be copied, whether by the goodness of factory owners' hearts or through a Marxist type, you know, worker uprising, but but they kind of started small scale. Um, mm -hmm. you know, and when Marxists, you know, started trying to, you know, form their internationals and, and do their work, um, they, they understood because they were Marxists, right, that that it had to be global. Um, that, that, that it couldn't be a, a, a bubble that existed surrounded by a hostile capitalism. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, so, you know, that, that led to the systematizing, right, of, of socialist ideas. And, um, you know, uh, various socialist groups started communicating and sharing ideas and getting together. And that led to the first international, where you had um, the first international meeting of working men, I think is its official name. Yeah. Um, and all the socialists of different varieties got together and um, that's its own whole interesting thing because it was its own like meltdown fight with each other. <laughs> but you had, you know, several different groups at that where you had Marxists, you had uh, Proudhon, um, who uh, I think called his, his uh, sect or whatever you call it, mutualism, yeah. um, which was um, sort of a market it based, but socialist worker controlled thing. That's its own interesting idea. Um, and then you had Bakunin, who was who was the anarchist and the Marxist and the anarchist in particular had like a, a really big battle with each other because there there was a lot of agreement on what the goals of socialism were, but there was a lot of disagreement on how to get there. <laughs> so um, you know, uh, many of the Marxists supported forming uh, you know workers' parties, labor's parties to to enter um, electoralism. Um, some wanted more um, outside of the electoral system to form parties and, and um, you know, like more union based things. Right. Um, and the, uh, and the anarchists were um, completely swore off <laughs> any sort of elections and electoralism. It was completely about building bottom up community um, uh, through like mutual aid and things like that. So there was a big argument and they yelled at each other and the, and Bakunin and the anarchists left. And so, um, unfortunately, that divide still exists today, where you'll you'll find folks on one side that don't like the other because they only read that one group's <laughs> writings. <laughs> um, but um, you know, in reality, what happened there is that the, the Marxists and the anarchists both had really good points. And so, when you get to the post-Marxists, when you get to more modern era socialists, you've seen that dialectic come back in, where the contradictions between these important questions that the Marxists and anarchists brought up they're starting to, to, you know, be thought about and, and combined or merged into something new. We're, we're developing newer things um, out of those uh, important points, um, also in relation to how capitalism is, exists today as opposed to what it did back then. Um, so you see post-Marxists um, and then eventually the green socialists. Um, we have various forms of eco-socialism and then uh, Bookchin social ecology that we'll come to in a moment. Um, so you can kind of see this progression of ideas here where, um, um, socialism, you know, because there's still a lot of unanswered questions, there's a lot of different types of socialism. Um, but I think our goal is not necessarily to say, um, one is better than the other or something, but to learn from all of these things through history, they all have successes and failures that we can learn from and we can pull together, to try to do better in the future. Um, yeah, I think that's the really, you know, that's the really key thing, right? Um, that Michael, I think it was Michael. Yeah, Michael Shin and, and on the Zoom had asked, you know, comments about attempts at socialist projects, right? Mm -hmm. um, which is kind of in here, you know, you've got the Marxist Leninists and things like that. Um, but the reality is, None of those projects have it have succeeded to the point that capitalism is a threat. Um, you know, right? The the and, and like it or not, overcoming 
you know, the pushback of capitalism is, is a key part of the success, right? So we, we've got to be able to not look to create, you know, exact replicas of what was done in the past. Um, we've got to be able to learn lessons, right? And things that worked, um, you know, in, for the Bolsheviks might work for us or they might not because we're dealing with a completely different type of system. And um, that was something that Marx was very, very you know, adamant about. Um, that how the worker revolution, how capitalism manifests itself, how socialism comes in response is a very local and a very unique, um, you know, expression in every different place and every time and every era and every location. Um, so how Garrett experiences capitalism where he lives in, you know, outside Pittsburgh and Pennsylvania and how I experience it, you know, is like where Garrett lives in Pittsburgh, you, you know, manufacturing used to be big now, I don't know you know I've imagined it's died quite a bit but it's like that used to be you know mining and steel country mm -hmm. um, whereas where I come from in some downstate central Illinois it's all about agriculture we've got some of the best soil in the world and we're destroying it with monocrops right so how these things manifest is very unique um, and that's something that Mark said very very pointedly um, that you know the, the the way that we go undertake these struggles depends on the material conditions upon which we're working with. Um, so mm -hmm. we, we can learn a lot from the past. Um, we can really take some of the values, right? Um, and I think one thing that's really important for socialists is a level of crit what I call, you know, what's called critical support, um, right? You know, Venezuela, Cuba, for example, have done made amazing strides in addressing poverty. Right, and if you go back to the you know early into the earlier into the presentation, um, we had folks talking about how the ending of poverty is you know a core value of socialism. Right, so when we look at that, we have to be able, we have to be able to look at these projects and say, you know, Venezuela has built, built millions and millions of social housing projects. You know, they they they've housed their people. Um, literacy is in both in both projects is skyrocketed. Um, healthcare quality in Cuba is, is, you know, amazing in many cases, uh, despite their isolation. Um, you know, so there's been there's been solid gains. You know, but at the same time, we've got to be able to have real conversations about the flaws. Um, you know, Venezuela's project is propped up by gasoline, by oil. Um, they they fund all of these things by selling oil, and just thus being, um, you know, they're a petro state. That's what they are. Um, and so that, and they are trying to diversify all, right? Um, but we can, we can, we need to be able to have these conversations where we, we talk about shortcomings and we talk about other alternative ways that we can, we can, you know, fight for socialism without writing the whole project off, um, right? The, 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 we live in a, we live in a system, Garrett and I are both bottom lefters, right? And I don't think either <laughs> one of us trust the state. Um, and in all of these cases, we have a state. Um, you know, so it, the state is often used um, to do not, you know, to oppress and things like that. So we've got, when it comes to these other projects, um, we've got to provide some critical support, right? We can't just give in to the capitalist idea that the Soviet Union, that communism in the Soviet Union, which wasn't communism even by their own, you know, admission, caused millions, of hundred million deaths. Right, that that good old stat. We can't acknowledge, we can't accept that as truth because it's propaganda. Right, people died all over the world for those things. Um, you know, through that period that they're crediting 100 million, and, and capitalism killed way more. If we're just calling every death in every capitalist state, you know, a death of capitalism. So we've got to be able to have this critical support where we can push back and and defend these projects despite their imperfections, but still be able to have conversations about their imperfections. And about how we can move forward and about how we can learn from them. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that gets into the next slide here, actually. Um, 